welcome to today's webinar with Megadeals Advisory. Christopher Engman, Bora Brandstrom, and me, David Klatborg. I would like to start to tell a little story from a person who had a rough time. But we have to go back in time. The time of the Vietnam War, Mr. Stockdale was prisoned in Vietnam for eight years. And he didn't know if he was going to come home to his family. And you can imagine the fear, right? And this story is brought through a great book, Good to Great. And I think many of you have read it. So this is just a reminder of this story. And over this long period of eight years, he was, he was beaten both physically and mentally. And when he comes back to his family in the US, he get a lot of medals and honors, a lot of hugs from his family who has missed him, of course. He was interviewed by several reporters and they asked him, why did you survive? Why didn't those who didn't survive manage to come back? And he said, in a way it's simple. He called them the optimists. They were really positive that if I only live through Christmas, I will be saved. So they were fixed in their mindset. I will be saved after Christmas. Christmas came and Christmas passed and they were still imprisoned. They set up a new goal for themselves. I will only live to Easter and then I will be saved. Easter came, Easter went, and they were still imprisoned. I think we can learn something from this. In this kind of situation we are right now, we rather be here and see what we can do, acknowledge what we can't change and adjust to that. And also like Stockdale did, he had a mindset that I will take this opportunity and learn from it. When he was back and interviewed in the US, he actually said, if I co can go back in time, I would do it all over again because I learned so much about myself, about people in general and how they react under these circumstances. I want to live a life and, and miss this opportunity to learn. And I think we can learn a lot from this situation as well. Uh, today, we will give you some insights of how you can work as a sales or marketeer. It's probably not about life and death. I urge you, do not think, if I just live through, the, then this will be over. Instead, ask yourself, what can I learn from this process? How can I change? and come out on the other side even stronger. We live in a very specific economic environment and it's probably just to start. We uh, recently read a report from IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and they said that this could probably be as bad in, in the economy, the BNP going down around 3% this year, something we haven't seen in around 100 years. So how could we prepare ourselves for today and tomorrow by just changing the way we operate in our business? We will touch base on a few things you can do from a marketing and sales pr perspective. And just to set the agenda, we will have a short introduction by Christopher. We will set the context together with Bora. Then we will dive into how can you win bigger B2B deals but with less investments. We will push on the things about disqualification, why that is so important, and also go into the topic around how you balance marketing spend. So with that said, I'm handing over to Christopher Engman. Thank you, David. Hi, everyone. Today's topic is about something we've seen both with proof analytics and in the Megadis research. And it happens to be very timed with the current situation. I wouldn't say I'm glad about the current situation. I'm, I'm really sad about it. Uh, but to work more digitally overall is the winning path. And we've seen it in proof analytics and with the mega deal research. So today we'll talk about how can you switch money and people from sales that is almost all B2B case are overfunded on feet on the ground. We have an overbelief in the sales force and we have an underbelief in marketing. 
So a few of the issues that we have in underbelief in marketing is that we, we evaluate marketing purely on leads and leads is a tiny piece of the entire work that marketing is doing in particular in larger enterprise deals. So we're going to talk today about the formula where you actually take, and I'm sure, uh, to, well, just to be clear, probably most of you on this call are pretty ambitious. Otherwise you would be sitting in your garden instead. So, or, or, or watching a TV show, you're probably on your toes. Otherwise you wouldn't be listening in. So you're probably on the safe side, even if you're on the sales, sales side that we recommend to be shrunk a bit. So in the formula here, you can make bigger deals faster with less money by cutting some of the salespeople, reallocating some of that saving into marketing, and you'll see what happens. For most of you, that form might be really weird or frightening. Yeah, and thanks, Chris. And I think the formula is not only about cutting, but I think it's, it's just a harsh reality at the moment where a lot of companies are under pressure to cut both the teams, but also spend an investment, <clears throat> but still under pressure to grow, right? So I think a lot of the stuff that we'll be sharing today uh, are, are hopefully also things that you could take with you that when you're in this environment and you are under pressure to, to, to kind of lower investment but still grow, some things you can hopefully take with you. So what you're looking, the slide you're looking at at the moment is also the kind of bell and S curve principles, which I'm sure some of you be, will be aware. The bell curve is the one that goes like this, and it kind of says that a majority of your, of your employees or your workforce tends to be doing a kind of a normal job. You have a, a chunk on one side that are really high performers, and then you have a, a little minority on, on the other side that aren't performing that well, right? Um, and the S-curve principles dictates that just because you add 10, 15 in headcount, it doesn't actually mean that you 10, 15 X your volume, right? So it, it, these are also key principles to take with you that, that headcount doesn't necessarily mean high performance. So the other challenge that we're facing today, we literally faced overnight, which is this social distancing, right? And all of a sudden, you, me, and most companies have had to adjust really quickly to start to do business in a more digital environment. And a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about and sharing with you today is where you actually use a lot of digital techniques to do a lot of sales and marketing. So it also plays into this environment very much. What we've also observed in a lot of the research that we did on the high performing mega dealers across the world, which is part of the book and the research, is that there are only a handful of these mega dealers and sales and marketing professionals that can actually orchestrate these large complex deals. And most of the time, they lack the bandwidth to be involved in multiple deals. So there are many deals either a, being left unaddressed, or B, you having to send in teams that aren't quali qualified enough to do the, these deals. And what ends up happening is that you increase the risk of actually failing. We talk about sales and we talk about orchestration. When you start to go from a B2B deal that is somewhere mid to large, where you probably have three, five, six stakeholders that you can probably get hold of and run some kind of a good dialogue technique or a sales process, and you start, we start talking about the complexity of, of a significantly more stakeholders, then we actually move away from a selling process to an orchestration discipline, which, which requires a complete different skill set. So just to summarize what we've talked about up until now, right? So we're in quite a challenging environment where a lot of companies unfortunately has to downsize and cut investments. We are kind of overnight forced into an, to an environment of social distancing where we're using a lot of digital tools. You know, the bell curve and S curve principles that we, we talked about, moving from selling to orchestrating much more complex deals. And they, and in a lot of these companies, there tends to be not enough they can orchestrate these deals and quite a lack of bandwidth. So based on these kind of uh, issues and challenges that we're facing in our environment at the moment, uh, what we're really going to talk about today is how can we still bring in big revenue deals, but with smaller and less teams. Before we do that, though, as we, we always do, it's really, really important that we briefly go over the five cornerstones of mega deals. And the five cornerstones of mega deals, some of you have been on this call may have heard this already, but it's really important because those are the five principles that came out of the research of how these really high performing mega dealers actually operate and orchestrate deals. 
So we're not going to go into them in any detail, but we are just going to go through them relatively quickly because that's the whole essence of how these mega dealers operate and how you integrate sales and marketing. So the first one is really important. It's about disqualifying early and hard, right? And, and the, what these mega dealers do is they, they ensure that what they're selling is aligned for the buying company's key initiatives because that's where the money is. And if, if it doesn't help the buying companies key reach their key initiatives or key priorities, they won't buy. So mega dealers are religious about disqualifying, right? As most of us are in a qualifying mindset, put as many things in the pipeline, as prospects in the pipeline as possible, in a transactional sale, I agree, but in a mega deal, it's the other way around because if you disqualify early, you're saving time, money, and resources on deals that won't happen. So that's number one. Second, once you have the deals that you're focusing on, the next thing these mega dealers are really good at, and that's really key, is to map out and understand the ecosystem, right? Because when you start to get 50, 100, 150 stakeholders, it's really important to understand how they influence the deal and we also see in mega deals that there are also stakeholders outside the buyer's organization, but still in the ecosystem impacting the deal. And if you don't understand this you, and you miss this, you increase the risk of losing the deal. Then on the third, the third uh, cornerstone is the hardest of mega deals. And we're going to be talking a bit about that today. And that's actually driving consensus in that ecosystem. So once you understand the ecosystem, how do you, how do you influence that ecosystem, right? And I'm not going to go into detail here, but the, the trick is here to use both physical and digital touch points to influence that ecosystem. And this is what some of the highest performing mega dealers do. The fourth then is about Trojan horses. These are the very, very important people in the buyer's organization that feed you with key information that you don't get the official channels that knows if you're winning or losing, right? And, and every single mega dealer we interviewed said, <clears throat> every single one without an exception said, if you don't have a Trojan horse in your organization, you won't get the deal. And the final one is um, uh, what we call risk mitigation. So we are schooled to talk about value and value and upside is important. It gets you through the door, but it's risk mitigation that closes the deals. And, uh, and these mega dealers, they bring up risk very early. They package the content and push it out in key parts of the orchestration. So these are the five, um, the five cornerstones. Um, keep them in mind as um, they are the basis of which we'll be, we'll be talking about the sales and marketing. So there are three things we're gonna talk about today. And the first one is really about disqualifying early and hard. And this is where we talked about key initiatives, right? You can save so much time, money, and resources if you get this right. Uh, so I've already shared with you when we talked about key initiatives, but we were actually working with a client of ours who was qualifying 95% of the mega deals that they were going after with a win rate of about 20%, actually quite under 20%. And after we implemented a very rigorous disqualification process, win rates went up to 50%. And they haven't even started the sales process or the orchestration process yet, right? So here is, this is an area where there's a lot of money, time and resources that you can win. Right? And it's going from the traditional V-shaped funnel, prospect funnel, right, to a T-shaped, where you disqualify hard and early, hard and early, and only focus on the deals that are going to, uh, that you, you see a higher probability of winning. Okay, so that's the first one. And now I'm, I think I'm going to hand over to Christopher, who is going to walk us through a few other ones. Here you go. Great, thank you. So going yeah, back to going back to uh, this formula, uh, and, and Climon is kind of the first uh, case where we've practiced this, where we cut uh, about half the sales force and move money into marketing, and the majority of the money went into account-based style marketing, uh, and we'll come back to that later, uh, and that drove a pretty significant growth in order intake from three to $90 million with a successful NASDAQ listing that was 10 times oversubscribed and with a few kind of high profile names as coming into the financial game of Climon like Jeff Bezos, uh, Bill Gates uh, and Richard Branson, et cetera. And 
I'll come back to, to more of that. So I'll give you a few things that are really key to understand. And these are coming both from the Megadils research and from Proof Analytics, where we use mathematics to analyze what's driving what in marketing and sales, both for B2B and B2C companies. So the first one is that you need to balance your spend between generating leads, driving your pipeline, and growing existing accounts. So almost all companies, and I suspect that most of you on this call are overspending on lead generation. So what we see both from the Megadeals perspective and Proof Analytics is that there's a ton of money going into events, uh, lead generation activities like emails, et cetera. I'm not saying these are bad, but you're probably, I, because I don't know all you guys, but you're probably overspending on leads and you're probably underspending significantly on driving the pipeline from a lead to a signed contract and then from a signed contract into growing that account with various cross-selling techniques. So this is the first, I would almost call it a rule. Uh, so you need to rebalance this. And if your marketing team is, is quantified, their performance is quantified on MQLs, please rewrite their performance criteria. It is not the right one. Uh, the second one is the balance between content creation and content distribution. So most B2B companies are overspending on content creation. I mean, there are some of the biggest brands in the world that have just beautiful, I mean, really well-crafted videos following the great messaging architecture with the great picture and footage and all of that. But when you see how many views each video has, it's like, it can be 374 views. But if it's coming from a company with 100,000 employees, you can suspect that out of these 374 views, three quarters are from your own employees. So we're talking less than 100 views coming from uh, uh, clients. And out of those 100, maybe half of them are coming from students and irrelevant people. So you're looking at a handful of views coming from relevant stakeholders. If you're not spending at least an equal amount, some, some people talk about a double amount on distribution, so 1x on content creation, 2x on distribution, you're doing it wrong. I wouldn't say this is scientifically proven. So this one, the other one is, this one isn't. So this is more based on experience than some of the, some of the interviews we've had, but it's not quantitatively enough proven to be a rule. But you should, we revisit uh, your spending if you're too heavy on creation and too light on distribution. Customers are not finding you and your website. You need to help them to find you, okay? And then just, uh, uh, I mean, some of you were listening to the messaging webinar. If you weren't, please go back and listen to that. But we're using three types of messaging uh, in the messaging platform and the messaging architecture. So the first one is taking you from a question mark to an exclamation mark. Change drivers, uh, category choice, subcategory choice, and why you as a vendor. Most companies are missing out on the category and the subcategory. And the second one is deal closing messaging, which is kind of erasing all the question marks that stands between wanting to buy and actually buying. And this particular piece of the process is consuming a ton of time and those of you on the call are coming from the sales side, I think you can, can experience this. When you look at all the deals you're in, this deal closing part is taking a tremendous amount of time. We're kind of making content on the fly every time and we're reusing some, et cetera. It's better to, to, to do it professionally as a team and reuse and adjust, but not just make, 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 okay? And then the last, the third part of the messaging is like a cloud surrounding the other two. The intention of that is actually to pull in because in mega deals and in large complex deals, you don't have to do the multi-billion dollar deals for this to be applicable. Even for the medium sized complex deals, you have typically, and I, I'm sure that in your sales teams, they're typically talking to two of your stakeholders. So we need to find ways to pull in a larger audience from each target account. One way of doing that is to talk about oriental, orientational messaging or oriental messaging that Bora sometimes calls. <laughs> <laughs> orientational messaging, sorry. <laughs> so, so it's to orient the, the, the and, and to pull. So 
we sometimes use the analogy of an Aston Martin car in a Bond movie. So we're, we're, we're sending the Bond movie, uh, but we want to promote the Aston Martin car. So actually Megadeal started as that once upon a time. It was a way to create the larger audience within the Fortune 500 companies when I was selling Compass marketing. So all of a sudden we had 50 people in the room instead of three. So it was easier to sell the new paradigm, right? So, so uh, examples of orientational messaging is to write about your, your target account or about their industry, the top trends, things like that. And you're being placed in a subtle way in that piece of content. The other two fundamental messaging is, is really sales oriented. Deal closing is as well. Orientational is a bit like, you have to think of it like a journalist. We're not going in depth into these today. There are another webinar. Uh, <clears throat> and then the, the way you play this together. So fundamental messaging is the first chunk, deal closing is the second. And here you have the cloud that is pulling in a larger audience and it's not specific to any phase of, of the buying cycle. And then you want to use the, these three types of content. You want to use them in your social, social selling exercises, in your meetings, because you want to have it in your sales material or as handouts that you can give away. You want to use it in videos, in webinars like this. You want to use it in your IP target ads, in your retargeting, in various webinars, in PR, etc. cetera. Uh, so if you got, get this right, and I'm sure this is a pain point that some of you can relate to, if you don't have this, you'll have internal debates internally whether this article is right or wrong. The reason why is that you haven't agreed on the fundamentals. You haven't agreed on the basic principle of, about, about what you should say and when. So I'm sure that some, some of you have been in those debates internally. Should we have this in the video or that? But once this is in place, it's really easy to produce great content at a high speed. So even in a small organization, you can do one video and one article per week if you have this in place. So, and it's also important to remember that it's not sequential. So it's not fundamental messaging first and then deal closing messaging. Why? Because you have a large audience and they're all moving in, in various phases. So typically what happens is what you see in this picture in the, the first, so in the first phase of communication and sales meetings, you're talking mostly about what is covered in why change to why us. But that is gradually shifting into more and more deal closing messaging because there are people coming in, even in the very late stages, there are people coming in going, okay, so I, I'm supposed to be in this meeting to qualify something. And you've had 18 meetings or 12 meetings with a client. Do you actually need to go back and bring up some of the fundamental messaging to them? And the same in various ads that you're promoting at scale. But it's also remember, important to remember that it's shift is in, in depth. So typically, uh, instead of being sequential, it's actually more like a, a spiral and the spiral becomes heavier and heavier. So it's a bit like when, when someone tells you, so, so can, we have, can we have a meeting around something? Then you instantaneously say, well, what, what is it about? Because you want, the, you want the 30 second piece of messaging. If you like that, you can decide to allocate more time. So this is why this bubble is growing. And this was a shifting in character. Orientational messaging is happening all the time. So, and these are some examples from lightweight to very heavyweight content uh, uh, that you're using throughout a, a sales process and with an existing client. Won't stop long time on this. You can, you can take a photo of it or whatever. Uh, but these are some examples. So, so in the book. Sorry. In yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all of these are, are, are definitely in the book. If you haven't already, go to megdeals.com or Amazon or whatever. Uh, so this is a summary slide of the basic, basic formula. So have a great, well-worked out messaging in the bottom. You then create videos, articles, posts, and all of that based on it. So you will find a homogeneous feeling across all channels and tactics and people because, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this as well, that marketing is telling story X, sales is coming in and telling the story Y, and when delivery takes over, they're telling story Z. That is not creating trust. And trust is a key, key factor in large deals. Bora. Yeah, before we do that, I just, yeah. I just want to, uh, yeah. let me go here if the, everybody can hear me. So just if you could, I, I, I love the way you talk about, because we talked about saying that you can actually um, deliver, you can go for bigger deals with less investment and with less yes. headcount. Yes. Yeah? yeah. And the stuff yes. you've shared is really great. And um, can you just kind of like now tie into, if you do all this stuff, so 
rather than having this huge force of yeah. people, if you actually get smarter with, with, yeah, yeah, yeah. with doing these things, how, how does that help you actually uh, do, do it with a smaller team? Just kind of share with the Yeah, audience. right. I mean, the basic principle is that I'm sure you have a pretty vast discrepancy between your top performers and your low performers in sales. So it's better to take your top performing half and you put a tremendous amount of marketing behind them. And for each salary, I'm sure, I'm sure you can calculate this, for each annual salary, you get a huge amount of marketing. That's why you can take a quarter of the sales spend and move it into marketing. All of a sudden, you become very marketing heavy. And you allocate it based on what Bora described on the disqualification. You allocate it mainly on the deals that you really focus on. So you become talk of the town within them and with a very small sales team and within a much shorter time because getting access to all of these stakeholders inside and outside the account that Bora talked about in the ecosystem is taking a tremendous amount of time. That's why some of the large deals are so long, but they don't have to be. So with this formula, you will close a higher win rate, larger amounts, and in a shorter time frame. So it becomes very financially strong. Brilliant. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Crystal clear. Yeah, and uh, just to add to that as well, that when you start using the really good, if you start using good content that Chris, uh, Christopher talked about, and you start using digital techniques to really push it out, you're also getting a bigger impact, right? Because you are starting to influence more people frequently in the ecosystem that you want decisions from. Okay, so um, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to share with you now is based on everything that we've talked about is uh, our journey. So the mega deals advisory journey. So we started, believe it or not, we actually started the advisory uh, just over a year ago, right? So April, 2019, maybe just before that March-ish, right? Uh, and we've had some, uh, we've really had an incredible journey, right? And we've had an incredible journey where a lot of people and a lot of the stakeholders that within sales, marketing and, and CEOs that we want to know what we do, I think we've done quite well. I think many of you who are listening have probably seen us on some kind of uh, media or whether it's on LinkedIn, whether it's on this webinar, et cetera. Um, th there's another great story where um, uh, David and I walk into a it's, a, it's a global company. They have an office here in Stockholm and we walk in and we're going to meet the VP of sales and marketing. And as we walk into the reception, we're confronted by the sales director and three of the sales people. And the conversation goes something like this. Hey, Bora and David, nice to see you. Welcome. It's really great to see you. Do you know what? We've actually, all of us registered for your launch party at the Grand Hotel. So we had a launch party for the book at the Grand Hotel. And two of us have registered for your workshop. Now you're all thinking, what's special about that? But David and I had never met these people before then. It's the first time we meet them. And they know exactly who we are. They know exactly what we do. And they've already registered to, to, to our events. How do you do that? How do you, how do you scale your sales and marketing in that way? Um, and it's a lot of the stuff that, that Christopher was talking about. And I'm going to share with you what we've done over the last year to bring some of this stuff to life. Okay. So the first thing is what you're looking at now is really the buyer's ecosystem, right? And, and, and we talked about um, stakeholders inside the organization and stakeholders outside the organization. And obviously what you see on the screen in gray is obviously we had tons and tons of meetings that most of you also do. And here's one of the challenges and the problems is that most businesses are too dependent on physical meetings and don't use enough of these um, digital touch points and techniques to drive consensus. So one of the things that we started to do very early was on LinkedIn is enterprise social selling. And I'm sure many of you um, are aware of this and have probably seen us on LinkedIn, right? So let me give you examples. So we created a number of different videos. We call this a pitch video. We created um, a, a teaser videos, etc., based on our messaging architecture. So this is content from our messaging architecture turned into video format. It's also turned into articles and posts, etc. Um, so here's some of the posts that we've done. What you can see on the, uh, I don't know if it's the top left for you guys, but it's, it's a picture of a, of a search from Sales Navigator right, where we've pinpointed the, the stakeholders that we want to influence in sales, marketing, and CEOs. And then we've started to post on LinkedIn posts that's not talking about us as a business, but driving thought leadership 
around the messaging architecture that we've developed. And let me give you the next example. So this is a picture of me and Mr. Sinek. And uh, it's a post that I, I, I wrote about, not talking about maybe deals, driving thought leadership. If you can see in the ring, you can, it's actually statistics of which company post well we are driving well I'm driving thought leadership and you can also see which comes so over Microsoft for example Ericsson you know 60 views 46 views how long would it take for you to get that many people in the organizations you're going after with the people that you want to influence to see your message right so um, and this you know it costs very little it costs nothing actually it's just time to produce so that's a way of scaling so that's one thing another thing we started to do is webinars which is well, and we thank you for joining today, but it's another way for us to scale our knowledge and to add value, right? And so we've um, already held, I think, six webinars. Um, this is the sixth, um, and you can find uh, all, all of them. You can actually find all of the ones that we've had on our YouTube, Mega Deals Advisory uh, on YouTube, uh, where we're also bringing in uh, people within the stakeholder group that we want to influence and that we want to add value to, to come and listen to the thought leadership that we're driving around orchestrating deals. Um, we also have a number of webinars coming up. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but we have a number in, in the pipeline that we will continue to do on a bi-weekly basis to add value. So stay tuned. Uh, um, and also you will be, uh, we will obviously send you um, invites as we get these webinars. So that's another way to scale uh, your messaging and content, et cetera, et cetera. I like that one. That's, so David, what's et cetera, et cetera about? That's a very coming. thought leadership. That's, that's really deep thought leadership. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, and then another, th another thing that we launched. Now, we're not saying you need to do all of these things. These are things that we've done on our journey, right? So we also launched the Mega Deals podcast, right? And in the Mega Deals podcast, we're actually interviewing some really, really phenomenal uh, experienced mega dealers and trying to extract the knowledge from them of how they orchestrate these deals, the nuggets of what they do, right? Absolutely amazing to listen to these, to these people. Um, and actually when we, um, when we interviewed for the book, uh, we interviewed over 60 and 40% of them were women. And some of the stories they had to tell were just mind blowing. So stay tuned um, and listen because some of those will be coming uh, in um, those podcasts. And you can find the podcasts, I think, on our website, on Spotify, on, on a number, all, all the, everywhere, everywhere you can find. But this is another way for us, right, where we don't have physical meetings, but we're scaling our thought leadership around how to orchestrate these deals and adding value. Um, and then, of course, the book. Um, I hope some of you have read the book. If you haven't, um, I really recommend you to do that. I mean, that really is kind of the, 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 uh, the content of, of, the, uh, of the research. Um, and you may also, some of you may know that we had this, this launch party at the Grand Hotel. Now, this is another, uh, I think, amazing story for me. So we invited, we had 650 people, sales, marketing, and CEOs, so quite senior, busy people, ambitious people, pay 300 kroners to come to the Grand Hotel on a sunny day, and we started four weeks prior with our first LinkedIn post. So four weeks prior, I went out with a LinkedIn post, and then we had a number of, of posts, um, predominantly on LinkedIn, but even on, on some of the other um, social media channels. And we managed to get um, th these customers to come uh, and join us for a day in four weeks, right? So if you get this right, and there was no paid media, so zero paid media. So when you get this right, Scaling your sales and marketing, the influencing the stakeholder group that you want is extremely powerful. Um, another one is network communities that we work with. So Christopher um, does a great job of um, traveling around and, and holding different type of keynote speeches at different networks. So one of them is Via the Natvaik. I can't say that in English. Um, there's another one uh, with, with Founders Alliance and Amchan, right? And we've actually I'm not quite sure the number exact in my head, but between 10 and 15 of the jobs that we've done have actually originated from Christopher holding a keynote at one of these, um, at one of these networks, right? In fact, we were, 
we had a, actually a workshop last week on Friday, which is we don't have these physical workshops that much anymore. Um, that was originated from one of these from one of these networks. Right? Amcham is upcoming. Uh, Amcham is upcoming, and that's a digital one, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So um, I'm actually going to hand over to Christopher on this one. Uh, but but as you can see, the journey that we've done, and, and we've just done this in a year, just over a year, right? Um, and the, the, the impact we've had is quite amazing. I'm going to hand over this to Christopher because Christopher has done, is it 480? 400 ABM cases, is that? Yeah. yeah. ABM cases, and I've done not as many. So Christopher's going to talk about this because he's brilliant at it. He's the inventor of. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so if you really want to annoy Christopher, tell him, tell him, oh, Christopher, didn't you bring ABM to Sweden? And you'll absolutely annoy him because he's actually, he's actually the first to bring it to the world. So when you say that, it gives him ticks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you. Great. So uh, I think uh, there are a few key takeaways regarding Megadeals Advisor's own journey. And one is that it's a, it's a very small team. The company is growing substantially, even though we're in the middle of a pretty heavy crisis. Uh, and I think at least some of you have seen the various touch points from mega deals, even though uh, it's such a small entity. And so if you guys are larger than a handful of people, you, you can totally manage this. Um, so I'm going to cover some of the stuff that we're now starting to do for mega deals advisory. So, just to be very humble here, uh, even though we're preaching this, it's not like this simple, but what we're adding now is uh, both the IP targeted ads where we pinpoint the organizations that we either already work with, where we want to grow the engagement, or companies that we really want to enter where we have an early, very uh, young discussion. Um, it's typically not used to generate wide scale leads. That's actually more coming from the social media interactions. So the ABM is more targeting towards actually connected to Bora's T-shaped funnel. You, you use it mainly with accounts that you have qualified or that didn't become disqualified. So they're the ones that are really fitting your criteria and there is an initiative that you can tie into and all of that. Um, we're also launching the Megadis Advisory retargeting which is, uh, some of you know this totally, but some of you don't. So whenever you bump into the Megadeals Advisory website, so megadeals.com, you get a small cookie and then you'll see ads about the webinars, the podcast, about the book, et cetera, that is kind of gradually in a subtle way following you to make you more engaged, hopefully. And in these ads, we're trying to share continuously uh, insights. I mean, not the ads themselves are so small. So these are some of the examples. We'll also have, you will, we will actually publish soon uh, and show you what the final ads were because we do quite a, quite a few pretty cool formats that you don't see here yet. Uh, and uh, so you'll see those soon. So the whole thing is about creating a good messaging architecture and then amplifying that through videos, article posts, et cetera, and, and this is the cool thing. If you have that in place, producing the various webinars like this or ads, et cetera, is a simple thing. So, so really start by the messaging architecture and that's really well described in the book or, or on David, et cetera, can, can help you out with it. So do you want to take on yeah. that? Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. Cheers. Okay, so um, we're kind of coming to the, um, t towards the end. And of course, there'll be time for questions uh, in the chat. So this is just, again, the summary. So the left-hand side, I think I've summarized enough. I mean, we're all living and experiencing conditions in our environment that impact how we operate today, right? Um, you know, from the economic situation to social distancing, you know, to, to kind of, uh, a, a lack of bandwidth of, of orchestrating these type of, type of deals. And hopefully we shared with you today, and we've summarized it in, 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 in three areas, but it's really about if you think about the teams you have, and you think about, like Christopher was sharing, how you balance sales and marketing, how you balance lead generation versus pipeline management and relationships, uh, customer relationships, and how you balance you know, content creation and actually distribution. 
And if you get that balance right and optimize it, you can actually start to scale your sales and marketing in a way that you weren't doing before and with significantly smaller teams and less investment with a bigger impact. They could, they, they could actually, to go back one. Sure. So, sorry, please. No, 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 there, please. It could actually be a fourth one here. You actually touched upon it. So to balance the span between customers, whoever, and your really, your customers that you haven't gone out from the disqualification process. So spend the me also the media money and the distribution money mostly on the accounts that really matter. We're going to start to finish off and we're going to get to questions. What we want to do today, you're actually the first group um, that we're sharing this with. So we're actually launching today a digital um, workshop um, or an online workshop where we're going to in a live environment. So we're going to be standing live and, and holding these workshops um, for you. And it's to accommodate to this current environment right, where social distancing has become a norm overnight. So we're doing these digitally. We used to have some of these uh, physically, uh, but also to accommodate for budget constraints, right? So the, um, the fee for these uh, workshops are actually very, very reasonable, right? So we are going, to, we're actually launching today. It's on the website. Um, so you can go into the website, you can read about it on the website and you can uh, register. Uh, if you want. And uh, the, the first three that we're going out with is the five cornerstones where we go through the five cornerstones of, of how a mega dealer orchestrates deals. The second one is around how you create messaging and then turn that into powerful content that Christopher was talking about. And then the third is about how you actually scale your sales and marketing. So what type of distribution do you then use? We shared a couple that we've been using and that's given us great impact with a very, very small team over time. So the first one's the five cornerstones. The second one is about messaging and content. The third one is about distribution of that content. And then we have a, 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 a whole package. So if you want all three of them, um, uh, there's even a more reasonable fee if you, wanted to, if you wanted to do that. And they're about three hours long. Uh, so go on the website and watch out for those. Okay. So I think we've come to the end. Um, and we are, let me just see that there's no other slides. No. So I think we've come to the end. Um, we've actually... Um, we, we, we're going to offer you one more thing. We're also, as Christopher said, we're starting to do these retargeting ads. And we are actually going to start with them soon. And you may see them. So we're, if you see a retargeting ad from us, and you take a screenshot, and you send it to us, the first five will get a Mega Deals book and a Mega Deals exclusive pen. All right? So if you see one of these retargeting ads and you take a screenshot and you send it to us and you can find us on .com, you can find us on LinkedIn. So either, either send an email or send us an email or how you want to do it. The first five that sends us a screenshot, uh, we'll get a book and actually use pen. Okay. So the question is, uh, if you're a scale up and you are about to, uh, go for, uh, another country, mm -hmm. uh, what should you invest in? Uh, more sales people or more marketing? No, 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 no. Great question. So uh, I totally recommend to shoot, uh, to do distance shooting first. So use uh, bee swarming. I mean, we, we haven't covered that today. Use bee swarming on social media. Connect with the, very, I mean, first of all, find what are the best ideal start customers for you. Then bee swarm, man, bee swarm them. And, and actually, so counter to the rule, you can, when entering a new market, you can pre-invest in IP target ads. So put IP target ads to create the beachhead into the new country, uh, because then that investment, even before talking to, to them, can make sense. Uh, and, and then just do web meetings, et cetera. I think there's an overbelief in most businesses that you should have salespeople on the ground before you can do anything. And the, the time of the Rolodex, yes, you, you do have an advent advantage of the Rolodex, but it's a bit overplayed. Uh, so I, I have tons of examples from proof from, from climb on, et cetera, where we completely did that. Yeah. Shall we read another one? Uh, well, no, you're standing there, Chris. You might as well go for it. So there's another one here that says, thanks for a great webinar. Thank you. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how to identify the stakeholders of a customer? And how do we manage all discussions within one CRM or 
other mix of communication systems? Right. So the, the, I would actually, the tech stack questions, let's defer it. I think we should have a webinar on that because that, the answer is a bit long. So as I would defer it, but the first question, so what should I use to map out the ecosystem? I totally think Sales Navigator, if you haven't got that addition to, say, to, to, to uh, LinkedIn, add sales, sales Navigator to LinkedIn, and then you'll have strong search capabilities and you can, you can pin your, your contacts, et cetera, and build out that network. But remember, as Bora mentioned earlier, it's not only about the stakeholders in that account. And this is totally relevant even for medium-sized B2B deals. So Lex247, where I'm a board member, we're selling to law firms and a law firm is 200 people max. Some of them are larger, of course, but most of them are like 50 to 200 people. And uh, it's still a lot of uh, people outside the account that matter. Certain system software vendors that you need to be a friend with and they need to say a few good words about you. Certain consultants, etc. Great. Okay. Another one here. So, uh, from uh, Peter. Uh, very energizing webinar. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Peter. Um, if you are a scale-up, competing on a regular basis with giants right. for innovation projects, what are the ways to get access to the high and executives that these giants have access to already? So if you're a scale up and you're competing, you're smaller scale up, you're competing with the big giants for innovative projects, how do you reach the top, top executive? So uh, I'll give you, a, so first of all, actually this tactic, this whole discipline is changing the game. So you can totally beat the IBMs of the world, if you do it and they don't. If they do it as well, it's much tougher. But if they don't, don't do it, you really level the game. So, but there are some specific tactics you can apply to reach top executives. One is the, something we use at Proof Analytics. So we write about, let's say we want to penetrate the e-commerce companies in a certain region. So what do you do? So a simple trick is to write an article about, let's say these are the top 10, 20 companies in this XYZ industry. So you make a small analysis of the industry, you write about each company uh, on the top list and you write about each stakeholder that you want to meet. Who do you think read those articles? Now, this is a, a, a very simple method and I hope not all of you will do this because it's pretty effective and as soon as all of you are doing it, I'm, I'm losing <laughs> because it's a smart tactic for us. But anyway, that, that's a pretty winning formula. And then, uh, so, so what you do then with the drafted article, you put it on LinkedIn Pulse and you send the link to each stakeholder and you're not asking for meetings. You're saying, hi, David Platborg, I wrote this analysis of your industry um, and I mentioned a few words about your company and about you. Could you please check that everything I've written about you is correct? The response rate on that email is 95%. So all of a sudden you have someone that is really kind of positive about you responding, saying, yeah, you got it right, but you should, if you could mention this as well, I would be glad. Um, you also have corrections coming like, yes, this is correct, but this piece of information is actually not correct. So, so you, you kind of both crowdsource the content and you get in touch with these stakeholders. And in particular, if you write that you're continuously going to write about the XYZ industry so I might reach, reach out to you again. So then they might take a coffee with you even though they're not necessarily there and then interested in buying. So you do get access to the top executives. I mean, there are many more te uh, techniques that we write about in the book, but th that's one kind of obvious one. That's a great tip. Thanks, Christophe. So we have actually, it's, it's not on the question, but it's really uh, for those of you on the chat. Just one more comment on that though. Sure, sure, sure. So I don't want you to overinterpret what I said. Many people think that doing large deals is about reaching the top executives. It's actually not. You need to start actually from the bottom. You need to build a, a, a pressure from below. And so if you take a meeting with a top executive, not understanding the target account on a thorough, basis, you will fail because the, you will get 30 minutes. But if you don't use those 30 minutes, if you come in and do this classical, yeah, I want to know what keeps you up at night and stuff, they throw you out. Uh, so it, it's not another, so there's one question, um, uh, stay there, Chris. Uh, so there's one question, uh, are we sharing the recording? Yes, we are sharing the recording. So you will get an email right after this webinar, uh, but the recording won't be on there, but there'll be coming one in one or two days. Uh, where the recording will be will be there. We also have, if you saw a gentleman called Tim, 
who thanked us for the, for the content of the webinar. Um, uh, just to let you know, Tim, thanks for joining. And for all of you out there, Tim is a fantastic mega dealer. We actually interviewed him recently for our podcast. And I'll leave you a cliffhanger. He was involved in a deal, in a mega deal worth 20 billion euros. I don't even know how many zeros that is. That's, That's too many for my, it's crazy. Yeah. So tune in, um, uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, he'll be sharing some of his insights around how he's been orchestrating some of these deals. So yeah. thanks. Thanks, Tim. Thank and you, Tim. For, for the rest of you, uh, stay tuned for that. David, any more questions? Uh, actually, it's a title, uh, but I want to remain confidential. But uh, if you can't manage all this yourself, uh, what do you do? I mean, if you don't have the bandwidth, but still have a lot of deals uh, sitting around on a, on a shelf somewhere. Well, uh, you guys are running deal orchestration. Shall I? I can well, just yeah. Start. Yeah, so I can just I, I can just share. We um, so this is the, so this is a, 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 a general challenge that we see out there. And um, we you know either you have you see companies that don't know how to do it, um, don't have the to do it, um, um, and then we have another category which is they do bits and pieces. So there's they, they do the sales element. Maybe they contact someone for social selling. They contact someone else for more IP targeted ads. They have another vendor for you know. And then they have all the, the kind of they have bits and elements of the orchestration, but struggle in how do I then bring all this together in an orchestration discipline towards a specific deal or industry. Um, and that's where, uh, you, so you can either try and do it yourself and bring it all together yourself, uh, or you can contact us because that's exactly what we do. So one of the services that we've recently launched is we call it deal orchestration. And we actually go in and we do two things. We coach sales and marketing on how to do these deals and secondly, we put together the whole kind of marketing package, if you like, um, that's directed towards winning videos, this specific ads, videos, ads, articles, IP targeting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so and, and the cool thing about this is that you, um, with our experience and knowledge and know how you increase your chances of signing more deals. But the other thing that happens is we're actually working with your teams. So they're learning and adopting the discipline as we work with them over time. So when we walk away, we leave that skill and knowledge in your organization so they can start doing them themselves. And so the business model is pretty sexy. So most of the money mm. comes only when you succeed. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, exactly. Thanks Christopher. So it's a, it's a share. Come in, come in. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so it's a share risk and reward model. Um, I put it here. It's a share risk and reward model. So we, uh, we actually take a retainer and then we have a success fee if, um, yeah, when the uh, deal is signed, deal, yeah. yeah. So it's um, it's a shared risk and reward. So it goes into deal P and L instead yeah. of a, an upfront yeah. investment. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? No. That's it. That's it. Okay. And we have about two more minutes. So okay. So we now two more minutes. Back to you. Yeah. So great. Thanks Thank for joining, you. and uh, you'll be getting the recording. And have a great, great day. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Bye.